Hey everyone, welcome to Chalk Talk. My name is Brock Galvin. Glad y'all could join this week's episode. We have the offensive coordinator at UC Davis, Tim Plow, but I want to introduce you to the E-Team coaching staff. We'll start with you, Sean. Uh, who was your favorite player to coach during your coaching career and why? Favorite player to coach during my coaching career and why would be uh, the one and only Quinn Kaler. Uh, actually was uh, uh, Johnny, Johnny Laird's quarterback at Dabla Valley College. Um, reason why, he came from a military family. His brother was a sniper uh, in the United States Army. I think uh, his uh, dad played with, um, uh, played with uh, some of the most famous musicians like Santana and uh, played guitar. Just a very awesome, unique, eclectic background in terms of a family. But um, showed up every day on time, great effort, very coachable. And he was like a silent assassin. Um, but I could also talk to him about, uh, you know, uh, 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 certain, certain songs, uh, music. I could talk to him about politics. He was just a kid, very engaging. And he happened to be our all-time leading passer to boot. So uh, he was just one of those kids that uh, you could tell him to do it one time. He'd turn around, next rep, done, and you never had to coach it again. Pretty, pretty special. Johnny Laird, how about you, man? Yeah, uh, Probably my favorite receiver to coach so far at De La Salle the past five years. And I coach at the freshman level, so it's really cool to see the guys that stick in the program and develop over four years. And um, I think my favorite, and it's, he's graduated, he's going to Cal next year, is Grant Daly. He's a, mm -hmm. a wide receiver. He came in to uh, De La Salle, never played football before, was a big baseball player. And he, he's – Six, he's a 6'3 white kid. He was dunking as a freshman. Great athlete, played three sports, um, wasn't going to play football, and fell in love with it. I mean, it's, it's started both ways for us, freshman year um, at receiver and safety. And then as his career went on at De La Salle, he stopped playing baseball. He probably could have got a Division One baseball scholarship, um, but just fell in love with the program and um, enjoyed him on and off the field. He was always first in the weight room, always first in line, great leader. And it was just pretty cool to see a guy that never played football before, but kind of came into the program, fell in love with what we were doing and, and really took instruction and coaching so well. And, and he's going to be playing at Cal in the fall. So it'll be exciting to watch him. Awesome. That's awesome, man. Good stuff. Uh, Dylan Cruz, who you got? Yeah. So, um, the, the first name that came to mind, Brock, when you were bringing this up was a guy by the name of George Helmuth. Uh, and I didn't necessarily directly coach him. He was a linebacker for us at Fresno State. But when I was a graduate assistant, uh, we had the task of running the scout team defense. Uh, and George was a local kid. He grew up being a, a Fresno State Bulldog fan. He's blue collar, tough, the type of kid that, that you know, made Fresno State famous. And when you're a graduate assistant, you have to run the scout team defense. Um, it's a lot of headaches, man. And a kid that came to work every single day, um, he, he got everybody lined up. He paid attention. He, he held other guys accountable. Um, so George represented what we wanted to, to be at Fresno State, the type of kid that we wanted to recruit. Um, and it was awesome to see, you know, after we left Fresno, uh, they put him on scholarship. He was a two year starter. I think he was an all conference guy. Um, just somebody that, especially when I was away from, from Fresno State and I was able to watch uh, from afar. Just so excited and so happy for what he's accomplished. And, um, yeah, that was the fa my favorite kid to coach, man. Uh, Danny Ferry was a part of the uh, trivia football guys team. He played college basketball. He's got no business on this podcast, no, no, but he like loves West Virginia football. And so the Mountaineer Minute is about to start in three, two, one. Take it away, Danny. Yeah, yeah, glad to be on again. Survived another week as, uh, as the honorary football guy. Um, so, yeah, glad to, glad to be on. Um, in terms of, obviously, I didn't coach anyone in football, but who I would have liked to coach um, probably would have been Pat White. Um, one, of, <laughs> one of those good Rich Rodriguez teams back in the, the mid-2000s, just, you know, first in the weight room, last one out. Um, a guy that the players want to play for, you know, I mean, you, you flash, you flash back to his senior year, 
um, snowy conditions again, South Florida on their, on their senior night. Um, and, and, you know, they, they played for, they played for Pat White. That's the kind of guy you want to coach. So um, that's who, that's who I'm going with there. Um, the, the biggest news I would say in, in Mountaineer football this week, uh, Saquon Barkley uh, tweeted out asking if there was a, a better college tape than, than Tavon Austin's only one highlights. And um, mm-hmm. I, I got to agree with him. I, I, I don't think there's a better tape out there. Uh, he had about 570 all purpose yards against Oklahoma uh, his senior year. Um, he didn't get touched once in high school, got tackled about three times in his four years at, at West Virginia. So um, if you haven't seen the, if you haven't seen the tape, it's definitely worth checking out. But um, yeah, I'm glad to, glad to see a former Mountaineer getting, getting some love on social media this week. So uh, that's, that's the, uh, the update here for, for West Virginia football. No, no, not Pat McAfee, Danny? Uh, he's, he's one. He's a funny guy. <laughs> He probably caused a couple issues for, for the coaching staff, I think, when he was there. He got into some fun. He did go to the same high school as my father. Um, so there is a, a little bit of a connection there. Plum, yeah. Plum High School in, in Pittsburgh to West Virginia University. So um, do you love Pat, uh, Pat well. For the brand, Danny. For the brand. <laughs> exactly. Oh, well, but- that Mountaineer Minute was presented by Modern Times, which is a San Diego brewery that we'll learn <laughs> more about during this episode. Uh, with that being said, thanks, guys. We'll get back uh, after the interview. But uh, without further ado, Tim Plow uh, and UC Davis. Hey, well, at this time, I want to welcome our guest for today's show. And Coach received a 35 under 35 award a couple years back from AFCA, was a quarterback at UC Davis, uh, started coaching at UC Davis. And actually, that's where I crossed paths when I was a player. Um, And then you kind of got the gig, I think, as play caller, age 25, um, which is pretty young. Ended up becoming an OC over at Northern Arizona and then back at UC Davis now as the associate head coach uh, and the offense coordinator under Coach Hawk. Uh, offense has done nothing but lead the country in passing yardage the last few years uh, with the Shredville attack. So um, for those of you who don't know, I want to welcome Tim Plow to the show. How are you doing, Coach? I'm doing great, man. Uh, thrilled to be here, especially with you. Always willing to help out other Aggies. So. Um, fired up. Thanks, man. Well, yeah, let's talk some UC Davis because uh, I got the shirt on. I know that um, you're bunkered down there in Davis during this uh, pandemic, but still coaching some ball uh, any way we can. I know I've seen you do some virtual clinics, but just kind of fill, fill the viewers in on your coaching journey up until this point and what you're enjoying about maybe your second go around at UC Davis. Yeah, I got uh, I got pretty – pretty fortunate in the, in the coaching circles. I, um, you know, my, my playing career did not go as, as scripted as happens for so many of us. And my senior year, um, I had a basically a career ending injury and our head coach at the time, coach Biggs, um, had mentioned that he thought maybe I had a future in coaching and I wasn't really fond of the idea, but, um, him and Coach Morosky uh, just kept pushing it and kept bringing it up, and and I still had to finish my degree, so I ended up being kind of a student assistant for the rest of that year, um, and became a grad assistant the following year, and uh, ended up really liking it. Just really took to the teaching aspect of it. My parents were both educators growing up, and and uh, I started realizing coaching is kind of the ultimate form of teaching. Uh, cause all your students are out in the public for everyone to see how good of a teacher you are. And then, um, coach Biggs and coach Morosky just saw something, something in me and made me the play caller. And like you said, at a really young age, I was basically the offensive coordinator. Uh, but they didn't give me the title cause they didn't want the public to freak out that a 25 year old was running the offense, but I was in charge of the offense and and uh, the direction we were going to go, and and they gave me a lot of uh, a lot of leeway and a lot of opportunity at a young age that a lot of guys don't get, and so I'm forever forever thankful for that, and um, got to try some things and learned a lot about what would work and what didn't work, and um, 
And then as Coach Biggs reached the end of his his coaching run, he retired. Um, you know, they brought in a new head coach and and uh, was a new athletic director. And usually when that happens, they're going to want to go their own direction. And Coach Gould wanted to go a different direction. And uh, so I had some opportunities to go different places, but settled on uh, Northern Arizona and moved out there. Not really know much about it other than uh, I had known a coach named Rich Scangarello, who's uh, – he was the OC of the Broncos, and now he's the quarterback coach, I think, for the Eagles. And he was there, and he had been at Davis before, and, and Coach Andy Thompson was the D coordinator, and him and I had become friends just coaching against each other over the years. Um, and so we, my wife and I, we just got married. We moved out to Flagstaff, and quickly I – realized in that time I was coaching wide receivers that if I was going to be a coordinator again, I really wanted to, to do something different and, and do something that I could put on spin on where the time it was, it was it's the offense coach Stoker, coach Biggs, coach Morosky. They've all run it for 40 years. And so I'm going to run the same offense they've run. Whereas when I got to NAU, it was like, Hey, you can do whatever you want. I just want you to score mm-hmm. points. And it was the first time where I had some freedom to do what I, what I wanted to do and, and things I was into. And so we uh, developed kind of what we're doing now at Davis, the Shredville type offense, where we are um, using the same pro style offense, but doing it in no huddle and then using the spread elements in the run game to mesh together. And, uh, Became really explosive, had a lot of success at NAU, and and was was loving it there. We had our first first son there, and my wife and I felt like we were going to be at Flagstaff forever. And Coach Hawkins got the Davis job, and uh, you know let me know that he was interested in me coming back. And initially, I, I wasn't very interested. Felt like the Davis thing had kind of already played out. But um, Kevin Blue, the AD, reached out, and I just felt like he had a special vision for things and on where he wanted to take Davis football and coach Hawk's such a great person um, that I want to be around good people and something coach Soaker and coach Biggs taught me when I was really young is, you know, uh, it's, it's about who you work with, not, not where you work or how much you make. And, and so um, my wife and I decided to come back and, and try to rebuild this thing and, and uh, make another run at it, and and we've luckily had some success. So, um, so it's been a, it's been a fun ride. And my wife's an Aggie, I'm an Aggie. So to be able to have some success here and and see the growth of the program, that's been really cool for us. Yeah, definitely. You say you know the the people you you coach with is important. I know just interactions with Kevin and Coach Hop, they're outstanding people. It's also the people you coach. And you've coached some really good quarterbacks. Uh, when you first started calling plays, Randy Wright was the quarterback. Right. And, and then, you know, going down to NAU, and I think it's Case Cookus, yep. a really talented quarterback that you coached. And then, obviously, the last few years at Davis is, is Jake Mayer. And I know he's working out, trying to have a, a shot playing at the next level. Um, what kind of makes – a quarterback special in in your eyes like what characteristics would you say quantify a, a great quarterback and you know I'm, I'm sure Jake has some of those so if you want to talk about him too I think it'd be great for the listeners to hear yeah I think everyone initially looks at like the physical tools you know uh how well does he throw it how fast is he how big is he and um that's that's great and some of those things are important don't get me wrong if I'd love to have the fastest guy and the tallest guy and the strongest arm. But if you look at over time, the greatest of the great at the quarterback position, it had zero to do with their physical attributes and had way more to do with who they are and how they're, how they're made. And uh, talk about Jake, you know, Jake is a unique person. He, he was, overlooked his whole life because he was short and because he doesn't have those eye popping physical traits in high school. He went to a small private school and they lost a lot of games and, and he didn't have a bunch of stats. And so he didn't really get recruited and went to a school back East, a small school and was, was really homesick. And so he came back and went to a JC and 
and had a great year as a junior college quarterback. And that was the time that I was coming to Davis and Coach Hawk had known about him and wanted me to talk to him. And I remember the first time I met him, he excused his family from the dinner table mm-hmm. and said, I want to talk, you know, one-on-one. And just kind of looked at me with laser beams in his eyes. <laughs> uh, I could see the focus and the determination and I could yeah. feel how much it meant to him. Um, so the three things I always think about from a quarterback is – you know, what kind of a leader is this guy? Does he have the leadership qualities where he can lead men? And, um, you know, I always say you want to be the thermostat, not the thermometer. You know, you want to set the temperature in the room and not react to it. And so um, the great ones like Jake, they set the temperature immediately when they walk in the room. You can tell this guy's in charge. Um, From a toughness standpoint, you know, they are going to go through some things that a lot of people don't understand. No, they're not a defensive lineman like, like you were Brock or an old lineman that physically is the toughest positions. Um, but you are going to take some punishment and you got to be tough and your teammates need to see you be tough because they're tough. You know, if, if the defensive lineman is getting hit every play and notices that the quarterback can't play through, you know, a sprained ankle or something, then immediately he's going to lose – credibility if you can show how tough you are both mentally tough and physically tough um, that's going to go a long way with your teammates and then the responsibility factor I just think a great quarterback understands his responsibility to understand what we're doing offensively understand the culture of our team and how that fits into him and how he can display that in his play he's got a, a great responsibility to do that on an every day not not just on Saturdays but I'm 24-7, 365. I mean, he's got to be responsible for our program and for the the brand that we have out there. Um, So when I recruit, I think about that. Is this guy someone that is going to be responsible for the really the livelihoods of the coaching staff and the success of his team is going to ride on this guy? And Jake had those things in spades and, and, uh, uh, obviously, he's a very accurate quarterback and works really hard at his craft. But I always admired him for for who he was as a person, and and that's why I think he had so much success. Yeah, it was definitely you know to use one of your words, it was a joy to watch him. And I think we talk a lot about it with our company, leading with positivity and poise. Um, shoot, during a time like this, right? Yeah, positivity absolutely. and poise. Yeah, and and I that's someone who he always seemed very poised. He always seemed very even keeled and that the environment didn't affect him. And and that like tough factor of, of taking hits and and being able to, yeah, like you said, really accurate dude and going to miss watching him. But I I know that you guys are always, it's fun that you got a Campo kid, which is down the road from our headquarters. And it'll be, it'll be fun to watch whoever ends up taking over the role this year. But yeah, um, and we were talking earlier uh, about just kind of who who we work with. And the reality is a lot of the folks who are, are going to check this out are, are young coaches. You know, we work with over a thousand football programs across the country, most from high school, NAI, JUCO level. Um, where did Jake play again down south? What, what JUCO? So he uh, was at St. Paul High School. Okay. And then, he, right. uh, and then he ended up playing at Long Beach City. Long Beach City. Yeah. yeah. And Coach Tuck was there during that time? So Coach Tuck was at uh, L.A. Valley. Oh, okay, that's right. And then uh, – but they obviously – they crossed paths. You know, they, they saw – really it was Coach Hawk's son, Cody, was coaching with Coach Tucker. Okay. And Coach Brady, our D-line coach, was coaching there. So all three of them had seen film of Jake. and okay. They didn't play him, but they were like, hey, this guy's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Well, and those guys are all kind of clients and friends of ours. And, and I know that um, this, like we were saying about leading during a time like this, it's uh, no one's ever experienced it. So right. sometimes you look to a mentor or someone who's wise as, hey, when you went through this, what did you do? Well, no one's ever experienced the coronavirus or, mm-hmm. or a pandemic. Uh, I don't think any of us were around during the Spanish flu. So what types of things are you doing as a coach? Like, how are you spending your time? How are you interacting with kids? I know the recruiting process has taken on a whole new shape. I've seen some things some schools are doing, but what kind of advice would you give to those young coaches out there on, on how they could be spending this time? 
Well, I know for me, the first thing that I think about is, um, you know, we work really hard, you know, coaches at, in all sports, the, the hours and the, and the pay don't usually, don't usually match up, you know? Um, so to be able to be home with my wife and my two little boys for an extended period of time, I'm trying to look at it from a positive standpoint of this is a great, great time for me to be a dad and be home and help my wife and, and help the boys. And I don't get to see them very often. And so that, that part's really cool. And I'm trying to stay as positive with that, even though you're locked in a house with a four-year-old and a two-year-old, you can only play shoots and ladders so many times, you know, like you got to figure yeah. out stuff to do, but, but that's been really fun. Um, so I would say the first thing is if you have a family and you have a wife and you have children, like this is an amazing opportunity to spend time with them and take advantage of that. But I have always been a, a film junkie. I, I, you know, when my football career didn't go the way I wanted it to, I always said, I'm never going to be outworked ever again. Like I am going to outwork everyone. And so I'm constantly downloading film. Uh, I wake up every day and try to treat it like a, like a work day. I'm going to wake up early in the morning. I'm, a, I'm an early guy. I'm a morning guy. So I'll get up, you know, before 5 a.m. and try to watch as much film as I can. Maybe it's our opponent film. Maybe it's different college teams. Maybe it's pro teams. I'm just going to soak up as much film as I can to improve my craft. And then I want to develop relationships with our players still. And, and mental health is something that means a lot to me. It's something I struggled with when I was younger. And and what a, what a strange time for a, a college athlete to be quarantined and not be able to work out and their identity can be kind of thrown in or, you know, so I want to meet with our guys individually and not even talk football, just mm -hmm. how you doing? Are you doing okay? You know, what are you doing today? What, what's your plan today? What's your schedule? And just make sure they know that they're loved and they're cared about. Uh, I think that's important, especially at times like this. And then, and then, you know, we're going to have our staff meetings and, and get ready for our opponents next year and, and, uh, and, and install our offense with our, with our players as much as we're allowed to. And, um, but the three things I, I always think about is spend this time with your family. Man, use this time to watch film, you know, and study <laughs> your craft and become better. Yep. And then lastly, don't lose those relationships with your players. Um, make sure they know that, that you care about them and that, that you're here for them, even though you might not be physically in the room, that they have someone they can depend on in a weird, scary time. Yeah, definitely. Um, that's all really good. I think it's really helpful. Um, before we get into a little two-minute drill we'll, where we'll have some fun, I got a little San Diego edition because I know you're 619. You're 619 oh, yeah. guy, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I got some – I got a couple local deals on there. Love it. Uh, what coach has made the biggest impact on your life? Yeah. Doesn't not, not like you being a coach. Sure that, but like your life. Yeah. Well, Jim, Jim Soaker, who uh, unfortunately is, is not with us um, anymore and passed away a few years back. When I was getting out of playing and starting to coach, uh, I was going through some, some really tough personal struggles. I mean, I was um, struggling with depression and struggling with – I had so many injuries that I had – you know, it's the prescription drug thing and, and – um, that had become something that I was a little dependent on and, and I was really out of shape and overweight and just had a lot of, a lot of problems going on in my life, even though I was starting to coach and um, coach Biggs and coach Morosky had reached out to coach Soaker and coach Jim Soaker is a college football hall of famer mm -hmm. coached at Davis for 20 years, won 20 consecutive conference championships and, and uh, is one of the best maybe college for coaches of all time that people don't know about because it was division two. Um, but I got a text one morning randomly and it said, Hey young man, um, can you meet me at Pete's coffee at 6 AM tomorrow? And I was 21 years old at the time. And I'm thinking 6 AM, Holy smokes. Hmm. Um, and I don't know to this day why I went, but I, I went and it was coach Soaker. And, and we just talked about, um, the struggles that I was having and, and where he thought those came from and how he wanted to mentor me and that coach Biggs and coach Morosky saw something in me and he want, and they wanted him to help me. And, uh, 
So he, he really – was honest with me and laid out what he thought my issues were and what he thought I needed to do to get better. And, and he said, if you're willing to do that, I'll, I'll continue to meet with you. And so we, we met every Monday for four years at Pete's coffee. And, you know, we rarely talked football. It was just more about life and, and mentoring and, and what it really means to be a teacher. And without that, uh, I don't know if I would even be half the person I am today. He he really shaped who I am as a coach. He was the first person to teach me the two things that that I know our offense is our our main pillars. Is the first one is detaching from the result, and what that really means is just in, in the world of sports, everyone's looking at the scoreboard, but you know we're really focused on how well we can play and and what we want it to look like and less focused on what the score is at the end, even though we're all judged by that, we're going to be hired and fired by how many points we score, how many games we win, but let's not, let's not define ourselves by that. And that led into, and you kind of alluded to it, finding joy. He used to always say to me the first time we would, I mean, we would sit down he would always start every conversation. He would say, young man, have you found joy? And hmm. And initially I would be like, what the, what the heck is he talking about? You know? And, uh, he would always start off. Hey, have you found joy? Have you found joy? And as I got older, I realized what he was talking about was, Hey, this morning when you woke up, you know, were you thinking about how joyful you were going to be today and how important this day was? Um, and so we talk about finding joy every day that happiness and sadness, you know, from for anyone, you know, if I win the game, I'm happy. If I lose the game, I'm sad. Well, let's not worry about that. Let's just be joyful about the opportunity and about being out here and being with our teammates and being with our family. And um, so the story about coming back to Davis, the deeper story is when he was getting sick, he didn't, he didn't really tell anybody. And he wrote me a, a letter when I was in Flagstaff that I have in my office. It's on my wall. I framed it. And the letter was basically – Hey, you know, I'm so proud of you. Um, but have you found joy? You know, with a question mark and your, your joy will come from, and he listed up a bunch of things, but at the end of it, he just basically said, if you have the opportunity to come back to Davis and help, I think, I think it would, it would mean a lot to, to me and it would mean a lot to the program. And he passed away about a week later. And about a month later, I got a call from, you know, I had a chance to come back to Davis. So it was, wow. uh, it was just a weird, a weird time. Um, but so I have a spiritual reason for being here too. I feel like I, I owe a lot to Coach Soaker, Coach Biggs, Coach Morosky. But detaching from the result and finding joy, those two lessons I really think saved my life. It, 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 how it's how I coach now and I have coach Soaker to thank for that. So without him, I would not be anywhere near uh, the type of coach I am today. Really powerful, man. I think yeah. if I'm, if I'm a coach, I, I always say this, like if you impact one person's life, that's massive. Yeah. Like impacting one life is so massive. I think we get caught up and I want to impact millions. I want to, I want to, be this big, you know, celebrity or something, or have all of these followers, like in this social media society. But, um, you know, if I'm a coach, can I impact one life? Right. And to, to hear that it takes four years of meeting weekly sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes it takes, you know, one thing you hear and it, and it just sticks with you. But other times, like relationships take an incredible amount of investment. And the fact that he did that and shoot, like the hair was coming up on my, my arms on the back of my neck when you said that he wrote that letter and a week later he passed and a week later you, you know, got this opportunity and to think of the success you guys have had is really cool. So that's awesome. Um, to some fun stuff, nice little transition to, uh, the two minute drill and then we'll get into your concept and, nice. uh, let you get on with your, uh, your zoom, your next zoom meeting that I'm yeah. sure you're heading into. <laughs> uh, so six, one, nine guy, San yep. Diego native, best burrito in San Diego. Oof. 
This is tough. I would say there is a place called JV's, and it's, uh, it's on Marina Boulevard. It's near USD, the University of San Diego. Okay. And uh, that's, that's definitely my spot. That's kind of my hole-in-the-wall spot. Uh, there's, there's a place called El Indio that everybody knows about that's kind of right off the airport that's famous. They do a great job. I like their stuff, too. In fact, when we played San Diego this year, I told our DFO, and he got the whole team El Indio burritos. So, uh, California burrito? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Anything other than that is, a, is a big mistake, yeah. Yeah, when we played down there, we – I don't know where it was from. It might have been that spot. But we each got two California burritos after the game we played USD. And Unbelievable. That was my first, first introduction to the California no. burrito. Uh, screen or draw? Screen. Screen. No. Player you had – a joy to coach like not the most because i know that's hard but first guy that comes in your mind you're like it was a joy to coach that guy dalton Trey jumps out Whoa. dalton Trey, i, I think he was the years um yep. i love that guy yeah walk yeah. on uh i don't know if you drink beer but modern times are ballast point Ooh, ballast point ballast point okay i got a modern times hazy ipa yeah. In my fridge. That's a tough choice. Uh, my wife might be mad at me. She likes modern times. Yeah. Yeah. There's like a thousand breweries down yeah. there. So I just figured I'd go with some bigger names. What position, like what other position would you have played? You were a quarterback. What would be the next one? You're like, ah, I wish I would have, you know, wonder what I've been like at that. You know, when I was, when I was younger, I was, I was a, uh, I was a better athlete. People don't believe it now because I gained so much weight. But when I was younger, hmm. I was a, I was a good athlete. I played outfield, um, and I always did a good job tracking the ball. So some kind of receiver tight end probably would have been something I could have gotten into. Um, and, and I played that a little bit when I was younger. So probably receiver or tight end. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Uh, I guess I didn't realize that you were the wide receivers coach at NAU, but what other position would you coach in football? Like is there – or maybe another sport? Or is I it mean, like I, a – I feel at this point I, I would love to coach any position in football. I think, um, yeah. you know, having the knowledge now that I've gained over the years, but, but, uh, and I try to, as a coordinator, I try to dive into coaching all the positions on offense as much as I can, but I would love to coach baseball. I mean, I would, uh, I would love it. In fact, my, my four year old is obsessed with baseball and it, and it fires me up because, uh, I just miss, that that sport a lot like it is a sport of failure you know like <laughs> if you go three for ten yeah you're in the hall of fame majority of the time you know yeah. i mean you are in the hall of fame if you your lifetime is three for ten where in football if you're three for ten you're never going to play you know so yeah um i love the the scientific approach to it the analytics of it and i think hitting a baseball is is the hardest thing to do in sports from a skill standpoint um so i, I would love to coach baseball if i could yeah. Baseball was so mental for me. I, 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 and I, I was, you know, a good little leaguer, you know, I was like the tall athletic kid, but it was so mental that by the time I got to high school, I was like, I just am going to play. And it was kind of that era of like, you just play one sport. You yeah. just now, now coaches are like, Hey, play, play all three seasons if you can. But yeah. um, in, uh, in this season, what do you miss most right now? Oh, uh, man, I just miss seeing people. You know, I just miss the interaction. Um, I miss being able to give a guy a hug. Like, I just miss – I miss the interaction with the players and the coaches and uh, just the that day-to-day -day feeling of having the guy down the hall that you can go down and talk to. Um, that's tough, man. I think that, And I think that messes with people's minds a little bit. Like, you just don't realize yeah. – I mean, you just – haven't seen my parents in a long time. I haven't seen yeah. my friends in a long time um, other than zoom meetings, you know, but I, you just take those things for granted. You know, the next time I see my best friends, you know, most of them are Davis guys, but man, I'm just going to give them, I'm going to give them a big hug. Whether Dr. Fauci tells me I'm allowed to or not, I'm just going to give them a big yeah. hug. Yeah. And uh, I'm not going to take those things for granted anymore. Cause, cause that's, if there's any positive from this, is you do see the things that, that are important, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, last one before we get into to some, some football. Okay. Find joy 
that's one of your mantras for sure that uh, you've talked about already. And, and I know that you've, you, you post about it a lot in one word, maybe that's too hard. What gives you joy? What gives me joy in one word? Um, or if you want to use like three, I would say reverence. Hmm. Reverence bring, gives me joy. Um, I, I, I think that to truly love something, you have to revere it. Hmm. I love it. Yeah. People can chew on that for a while. Yeah. All right, man. It's uh it's chalk talk time. Okay. Uh, feel free to grab the mic and, and share your screen and, and break us, uh, break some football down for us. Great. All right. For a D line guy like me. <laughs> All right. So this is a, uh, one of my favorite concepts that we've run for a long time, even when I was a player back in the day and it's an old West Coast offensive, offensive play. Um, we call it sluggo seam. So we're trying to get an isolated receiver on a sluggo route, which is going to be a slant and go, where he's going to take three vertical steps, three steps toward his slant, and then run the go off of that. And obviously you run a couple slants, the corners get a little nosy, you can try to get him on the double move. On the back side of this play, we're going to run a seam or a bender, as we like to call it. And this receiver has the ability to, to pipe it down the middle of the field or run the seam down the hash. And on the same side as that seam, we're going to have what's called a width hitch, which is a little bit wider outside the numbers and a little bit deeper because we're not throwing this on timing necessarily. Uh, the three things we talk about on pass plays are the protection, the progression for the quarterback, and then his drop. So this is a max protection play, which is another thing you can feel good about is uh, you only got to get three guys out into the route concept. So if you want to do a full slide protection or, or have these guys help in protection, the tight end and tailback or two backs and then get them out and check down, you can do that. So you're very well, well protected. It's a half field read for the quarterbacks. What we mean by that is he's going to split the field in half and he's deciding basically whether he likes the sluggo or whether he likes the seam. And the drop for the quarterback is a pump drop. So he's going to create a pump fake within his drop. And that pump fake will either be a short fake to sell the slant or a deep fake where he's trying to pull a safety to get the seam. This is a play that you want to run against a one-high defense. So if you're a, a coach out there and you're playing against a defense that only has one high safety – this is a play that we'll get to. Our quarterbacks will even check to this play when they get a one-high defense. And what the quarterback's looking for pre-snap is he's trying to see which route the one-high safety is cheated towards. If he's cheated towards the sluggo, then we're going to pump the sluggo and throw the seam. If the one-high safety is cheated towards the seam, then he's going to pump the sluggo and try to throw a touchdown to the slant and go. A couple coaching points on the routes – on the sluggo, the main thing we say is drive for five. So any double move, if you sell the double move and then you start going into your go portion, you want to drive out of that for five yards. You want to run for five yards before looking back to the quarterback. A lot of receivers, especially young ones, when they win on the double move, they get excited and they immediately look back to the quarterback for the ball. We want to teach our guy to drive for five out of that route and then look back for the ball. For the bender, he's looking at the near safety. So he's going to read the safety that's near him. If that safety is low, then he can keep it high. If that safety is outside of him or deep, then he'll break it off. So he has the ability to read that near safety and make a decision off of that. So I think that's important for those two routes. And again, we want to get a one-high defense if we can. If the sluggo gets pressed, some, peop some people will, might just have him run a fade. We don't do that. We run what's called a give-it route, where we tell the wideout, hey, you're going to release off this guy, but at five yards, we want you to give him something, whether that's a, a hard step towards the slant or a stutter down like you're running a hitch, but give him something to change the speed and change the dynamic of the timing because the quarterback is going to be pump faking. And if you just run a fade and just go, 
you might be too far downfield and his timing might be off. So we call that a, a give it route. I think we have an example of that on, on some of the film. So this play was made famous by, uh, you know, Rich Gannon at the Raiders and a couple of these guys back in the day. But the guy that runs it the most now is Drew Brees. This play will probably get him in the Hall of Fame. So what we're trying to do is, again, we're trying to get a one-high defense. We got a safety. He's a one-high. So he's got the look he wants. Now we want to see, is this safety cheated towards the seam or is he cheated towards the sluggo? And a lot of times that guy might be right down the middle and the quarterback will have to make a decision more on matchup and things like that. And right here, that safety is slightly cheated probably towards the seam, if anywhere, if not down the middle. So you're going to see Breeze now take his drop, and he's looking to pump fake and then throw this sluggo, right? Pump fake and throw the sluggo to the receiver. Receiver is going to take three vertical, three in, and then drive for five out of the route. The great thing about a sluggo is even if a good corner stays on top, we can have our quarterback back shoulder this ball because there's going to be enough space on the double move to create that. And that's what Breeze does a good job there of, of hitting that back shoulder throw. This look here, again, we got a one high defense, trying to see where that safety is cheated. Looks like he's right over the football, maybe cheated slightly towards the sluggo. So this is the time where you want to pump the sluggo as the quarterback. You want to give a good hard pump fake and make that safety believe you're throwing the sluggo. Get him to run towards that sluggo so that we can try to hit the seam away from him. Right? So we're going to pump the sluggo and then throw the seam back to the other side. And you can watch this safety here. He started on the hash, but that pump really moved him, got him running towards the sluggo. We can throw that thing back to the seam. All right, again, a one high defense. The two receivers are now up here. This might be a, an Omaha or a, a quick out that they put on instead of the whip hitch. But you got your sluggo right here, and you got your seam up top, right? Where is that safety cheated? He's clearly cheated towards the sluggo on this picture. So we're going to go ahead and pump him and then try to get this seam right down the, right down the hash. One high defense, trying to see where he's cheated. Looks like he might be cheated a little bit towards the seam here. Breeze doing his own thing, ends up throwing it back to that side. But you can see with the safety cheated towards the seam, he was able to play that thing a little tighter and made a little bit of a tighter window for, for the quarterback. Breeze is obviously super accurate, so it makes it work. But I think in hindsight for us and our teaching, you can see where this guy's these guys' feet is. They're cheated towards the the seam side. A different look at it. Instead of running a sluggo, the Falcons here have a little out and up. So they're selling the quick out from a tight split and then getting the quick out and up going. But again, this is all about where the safety is. The high safety, he's cheated towards the seam, right? He's cheated towards that side. So we feel good about getting that double move up top. Here's a couple clips of, of us running over the years. So at NAU, again, where's that one high safety cheat? He's cheated towards the sluggo. So we're going to go ahead and pump him to that side, get that safety to move, and then throw that seam away from him. This is a great clip, one of my favorites. So we're in a one high defense. Our quarterback at Davis, you know, we, the quarterback runs a lot of things at the line of scrimmage. He calls the protections. He checks plays, does a lot of different moves. So he's going to go ahead and audible. He wants to get to a sluggo seam. The defense changes their rotation. So initially, the one high safety was cheated towards the sluggo and looked like we were probably going to be throwing the seam here. But the safety's changed. This safety now changes his rotation, so he comes down. And now the one high safety is actually cheated towards the seam. So now the sluggo is probably the better throw. All right, so we went on the sluggo, and he hits that for the big one. Here we're out of a wing set, one high safety. He's cheated towards the sluggo. So we can go ahead and work that seam. A 
footwork wise, again, we want to be able to pump at the top. So he's taking a three step drop and he's pumping at the top of that drop and then sliding forward to make that throw. Lastly, another look at it here. Got a one high defense. Where is that safety cheated? Good look at a give it route right here by our wideout. Got pressed by the corner. So he's going to give that guy something before five yards. He gives him a little one step to the slant before he takes off. And he would have won there if that would have been where we go with the football. But we end up pumping and throwing the ball back to the seam. And you can see from this angle, this is a great angle to look at for the, for the quarterback, is where is that guy cheated? He's cheated towards the sluggo. Great. I'm going to help him stay over there by pumping and trying to get him to move so that I can open up that seam. Another good look at a give it route. So we got a press corner up here. Safety's cheated towards the seam. That's where we want to work. So watch the receiver. Good release. You see him change pace of four or five yards just to create that level of space. Quarterback ends up throwing a nice back shoulder ball there in the one-on-one. -on -one. So that sluggo seam. You got one high defenses, a great way to have good protection. You can get seven guys involved in protection. You can get your best guy in a one-on-one. -on -one. Try to put that safety in a bind so you can get a touchdown to a sluggo or a seam. I love it. Well, thanks, Coach. Um, hopefully this helps some some guys out there who are trying to add something to their arsenal. I know you, you had mentioned that this is uh, an install that you think a lot of high school programs should do, and, and it wouldn't be too difficult for them. And, and seeing it, the Idaho State clip wh where the late shift with the secondary and, and the quarterback being able to recognize that and, and go to the opposite side was, was especially one that stood out to me. So yeah. really cool stuff, man. Um, Hoping nothing but the best for you guys uh, up there and staying safe and health, healthy and obviously social distancing during this all. But it seems like there's been some positive news. And so we're, we're riding that positivity down here and hoping that, um, you know, the distancing gets lifted here soon enough. But um, appreciate you coming on. Um, best of luck next year. And um, we'll talk to you soon. Yeah, anyone listening, you may not – I don't know if Brock, how much he talks about himself, but Brock is the ultimate, ultimate story for someone yeah. that got more out, of the, more out of themselves and reached their full potential. And uh, we call those guys Davis guys here at UC Davis, a Davis guy. And a Davis guy is a special person that reaches their full potential in all avenues. So Brock was a heck of a football player, even though he probably never talks about himself. And, uh, so we're super proud that he represents our university. And uh, so I'm happy to help any way I can, man. Thanks so much, man. Appreciate that. Yeah. So good stuff from the prodigy, Tim Plow, taking us through some sluggo, teaching a, a D-line cat like me a little back-end coverage, which I have no idea. Uh, we talked about, uh, his coaching journey. We talked about what makes a, makes a quarterback special, how coaches are spending their time during COVID. And uh, we learned that his wife likes modern times and he likes ballast point. Sean, I think you got a ballast point that you're rocking right now. So we are actually representing the San Diego breweries in which he frequents. Um, but I think a good place to start is, uh, is quarterback play. Dylan Cruz, I know you were a quarterback and you coached him. Sean, I know you were a quarterback and you coached him. Danny, you kind of look like a quarterback. And then, John, you uh, catch passes from quarterback. So, um, yeah, what, what do we think about what makes a quarterback special? Like, what, what characteristics really stand out to you? And, like, what, what are some quarterbacks that come to mind, other than Tom Brady, because we don't want to talk about him? Anyone else? What comes to mind, uh, Dylan and Sean? I don't know, as the resident quarterbacks, what, what's kind of top of your mind? Go ahead, Dylan. You go first. All right. Um, you know, one of the things that coach was talking about was all the uh, physical attributes. Obviously, you know, to have a tall guy, big arm, all that stuff is great to have. But one of the things that I always look for was uh, the competitiveness of the guy. Um, if, he, if he was on a winning team, uh, if the guys played for him, I think that's, those are all something that uh, take, take in, uh, 
a big factor when you're playing the quarterback position. One of the things we used to tell guys when we recruited, when we recruited them was it's different to play quarterback. You know, you're going to have to make decisions throughout the course of uh, your college career of when, you know, the running backs, wide receivers, they all want to go out on a Thursday or Friday night, but you got to be the one to hold them accountable say, Hey guys, the bigger picture is this, um, yeah. uh, you know, the, the love for the game, I think is, is something that, uh, is talked about. I don't know if it's necessarily enforced when guys are recruiting quarterbacks. Uh, you got to really love the game of football. If you want to be a quarterback, uh, going back to you're different than anybody else on the team. You, you have the ability or you get the opportunity to touch the football every single play. So, um, you know, preparation uh, is a direct thing from loving the game. You have to love the game and want to be great in order to be a good quarterback. So uh, I think that all goes back to being a competitor. Um, so mm -hmm. uh, I think that's that's probably one of the, the things that I look for most in a quarterback is uh, the competitiveness. Yeah. Good point. What about you, Sean? Um, I'd say for me, I think it was always looking at, um, you know, there's the, like coach said too, there's the physical components, right? There's the dream scenario in terms of what you'd like at the, at the physical attributes of, of, the, of the person playing the position. Um, I think one thing that goes along with those physical uh, traits is you have to be accurate to play quarterback. And especially nowadays, I mean, you know, when, uh, when back in the, 70s and 80s, I mean, did you really have to be accurate or did you just need to be able to uh, be maybe more of a, was leadership a, a trait that you maybe valued more than your ability to throw the football? Um, the game has changed and evolved so much. Nowadays, I mean, when you're throwing the ball 70, 80% of the time, you have to be accurate or you can't play the position. So I think there's, the, there's that side of it. But I think the beyond the physical aspect of it, I think the one thing that I always looked at, number one, was functional intelligence. Like you have to be able to function in the construct of what we've built and intelligence kind of spans a lot, right? Your intelligence when it comes to emotional intelligence, um, are you able to, you know, are you the guy with the ice in his veins? Can you, are you the three C guy? Are you calm, cool, collected, no matter the stakes, right? Um, functional intelligence is, can you be the, ex the extension or can you be the extension of the coach on the field? Can you keep a huddle together? Can you keep everyone calm and cool when things don't go our way? Um, and then functional intelligence is, can you process what we need you to do? You know, are you a half field read team? Or are you a one to two to, to take off and run? Like we've seen a lot in the game today, or are you full field, full field reads, but you've also got to set protection. You've got to be able to, so from the, the functional intelligence side of it, I think there's a lot that's demanding of that position. And like, Dylan just said there's so much that goes into playing the position you've got to find somebody that really can can harness all of that but you also got to be able to deliver the mail because none of that matters if you can't deliver the mail if you've just got a wet noodle and you can't you can't hit a broad side of a barn <laughs> probably can't play quarterback yeah and he talks about that you know the accuracy being one of the biggest things for him another thing he mentioned uh when we were discussing the characteristics of a quarterback and it really stood out to me just in leadership period. And we talk a lot about that at our company is that the quarterback better be the thermostat and not the thermometer. That was great. When, when, so Jake Mayer, the quarterback last few years there, he said, when he walks in a room, he sets the temperature. Everyone knows he's in the room and he commands the room and he has, he has hold of it. He has control. He says, I don't want my quarterback to be reacting to the temperature. I don't want them to be the thermometer going up and down. They have to be steady. And we talk about that as a company, like during this time, especially leading with, with positivity and, and poise. I guess one of the things I'm thinking is like, what quarterbacks have, have we either played under or coached or seen at different levels where we're like, that dude is the thermostat. That dude is setting the stage. So it's a good question, Brock. And, and as a receiver, and I'm pretty unique, in my eight years of playing tackle football, I had eight different quarterbacks throwing to me. I never had the same quarterback wow. in back-to-back -back years. All the way back to my freshman year at De La Salle, I had Aaron Ropp, and then I had Nick Montana, Joe Montana's kid, sophomore year, then Blake Wayne, then Bart Houston. And then in college, every place I was at, I had a different quarterback. So I've 
caught a lot of balls from a lot of different guys in some big time situations. And the one guy that sticks out through and through, and it, it, it parallels exactly what coach Klaus talking about is who's the guy that comes in and sets the tone. And, and for me, it was Blake Wayne. I mean, Blake Wayne is a five ten, five eleven with cleats on maybe uh, quarterback who at De La Salle, he was working at, he was lifting with the linemen. He was lifting him in linebackers. He would smack talk different guys, but when he, we got in the huddle, we knew we were going to be good. We knew we were going to be okay with him. He had that moxie about him, that intestinal fortitude and shit. Then he went off to DVC one semester, went to Fordham and then ended up being coming a receiver and having a great career at Fordham. But I mean, that just speaks volumes to a guy that has those intangibles. Um, wasn't a six, four, big, big thrower, pac 12 guy, but shit, he's a guy that you'd go, you know, into battle with. No, no question, but, you know, when and where we're going. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Um, Danny, do you know any, have you ever heard of a quarterback or know what they do or <laughs> what's, what does that mean? How are you perceiving this conversation? Yeah. I, under, right, baby. <laughs> I, I get the general concept. I think, uh, I, I think I'm going to steal that uh, thermostat thermometer uh, line though that's good I really like that I think that can that can go across sports I think I'm stealing that going forward <laughs> well I want to kind of close things out with uh, a little bit of x's and o's we're not we're not the experts right uh, the unique position of e-team sponsor is that a lot of our employees are former college athletes all of us sitting here are uh, all of us have coached or are coaching and we get the opportunity during these chalk talks to, you know, the first one being with Coach Plow, a guy who, you know, top 35 under 35 AFCA award since 2017. UC Davis has had the most passing yards in the country at all levels of college football. The dude's smart. And he, you know, when we were talking about doing this together, he said, I just want to, you know, show a simple concept that any high school football coach, because he understands our audience, could implement in their playbook, no problem. And so he took us through this Sluggo seam. And, you know, just last week, Football Scoop had him do a virtual clinic. AFCA had him do a virtual clinic. So to be able to have him as our first guest on the Chalk Talk is pretty special. Um, I play defensive line. I know uh, the uh, nine on seven period in football. I know uh, <laughs> run fits and pass rush lanes and uh, anything there, back end stuff I have no idea about. I'm not going to act like I do. Um, and so I thought it was really, really great for him to show a simple concept of a one high safety and reading the field and, and the clips of, of Drew Brees and, and Jake Merritt at UC Davis. But for those who have more experience, what were kind of your takeaways and what's your experience been with Slogo and, and what do you think? Uh, some of our listeners would would be intrigued to hear maybe questions from Coach Plow's talk. Dylan, maybe we'll start with you. Sure, yeah. Uh, Sluggo scene, man. Uh, it was uh, one of Coach Kesaw's babies is how he described it in 2016 at Fresno State. Um, we used to call it swim. You know, signal still runs in my head right here. Uh, <laughs> we watched a lot of tape on Norm Chow uh, in the 05, 06 um USC Danny games. you know who Norm Chow is uh name rings a bell come on man <laughs> he yeah, he was a big time coordinator uh out in this area Utah uh SC UCLA the Titans the head coach at University of Hawaii I think he was involved in the XFL a little bit most recently yeah. mm -hmm. um but I had an opportunity to live with uh, uh, and coach with a guy that he coached at the University of Utah. Uh, eventually, he went on to be the offense coordinator at the University of Hawaii, and he loved this play as well. Um, the good thing about it, it's a, it's a seven-man pass pro. It's an opportunity to take a shot. Uh, coach uh, teaches it a little bit different than, than how we taught it. We taught it as a progression read. Uh, started with the sluggo uh, to the near safety, um, to the middle read or, or bender, as he called it, the wide apart hitch. Uh, the other thing about it is it was a part of our core uh, and there were many opportunities on how to hide the play. Uh, you weren't just going to come out in a, a two by two or a three by one formation, depending on protection and throw sluggo seam. Uh, Coach Chow did a great job of hiding it, uh, getting in 21 personnel, uh, reducing the split of the Z, motioning the fullback out to have the wide depart hitch, 
So there, the good thing about this play is you can run it from a handful of formations. We knew uh, at Fresno State if we were playing a heavy quarters team uh, and if we were going to get single, single coverage on our X being a three-by-one, we were going to motion a three-by-one so they would check the four uh, and play four heavy or four push or four solo or whatever everybody calls it and take advantage of the sluggo seam. The one thing that I liked about it is he talked about press coverage on the sluggo. And we were one of the, the teams that he talked about that if we got pressed, we just converted it to a, 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 a vertical. Yeah, and one of the things that he talked about was uh, calling it a give em. And he had great clips of having a press corner on the sluggo and having the receiver still be really patient, um, give an opportunity or a, a give it at five yards and then put his head down for five yards vertical. Um, that's something in the future. Uh, if I ever have the opportunity to install sluggo seam or AKA swim, uh, I definitely add the addition of, of the give em route. So uh, a little bit we were we taught a progression he taught at half field but definitely uh a big fan of it against single high so perfect thanks dylan but at, at the freshman level at dale sal when we run sluggo it's a little bit different having a 14 year old <laughs> trying to read <laughs> so we we make we make it real basic uh when we're we, we call it our city series package, which is, you know, it's three step Sonoma, four step out. So it's very simple, very basic. So if we're hitting Sonoma a lot and we see the, the corner jump in it, we'll, we'll make a, a decision to, we call it Sonoma Sluggo, where our Z runs three step slant, two steps in. And usually that corner, 14 year old cornerback from Bellarmine tries to jump it. And we, we run past them for, for 60 yards. So very basic. At De La Salle, the freshman level, but it was good to hear a little bit more of how Coach Plow was breaking it down because he does a really good job of just getting it down to the basics too for us. So I thought that was neat. Sean, yeah. how about a Sluggo story from you, man? Got a Sluggo story for you. Um, I'm not a Raider fan, but I'm a Niner fan. And uh, our the, the 49ers GM right now is John Lynch. And I don't know if any of you remember from the – 2002 heard of that guy. Super Bowl. Yeah, yeah, John Lynch. Dan, Danny's probably heard of that guy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Danny, <laughs> Danny, you know John Lynch? Da Danny, did you know John Lynch played both football and baseball at Stanford and he was did. a higher recruit? He, was, he had a higher recruiting rating uh, to, as a baseball player than he did football. I did not he know that. He was recruited out of, uh, out of San Diego by uh, the legendary Bill Walsh, who I'm a huge fan of. <laughs> and um, uh, uh, John Lynch actually. Uh, was playing quarterback, played quarterback for his first two years at, uh, at Stanford. And then uh, Bill Walsh said, you're too good of an athlete not to have on the field. we got to get you on the field and move him to safety. Anyways, legendary, uh, you know, Hall of Fame career later. Um, but uh, Sluggo Seam, I'll never forget, 2002 Super Bowl. Uh, it's kind of uh, ironic that we're talking about Coach Plow and San Diego and at San Diego Beer, here's San Diego's finest. Coach Lynch, uh, or John Lynch, uh, uh, coaching it up on the field. Uh, playing against the Raiders, the Raiders uh, uh, were were famed with Coach Gruden for or, uh, for running the sluggo scene. Uh, coach Gruden gets traded to the to the Buccaneers as a head coach. How many times have you seen that happen? By the way, head coach get traded. <laughs> uh, and and then uh, the Super Bowl. And then yeah, and then and then he plays the team that he coached the last <laughs> the previous year in the Super Bowl, which is crazy. But um, knock uh, if you're with me. Yeah, knock, knock if you're yeah. with me. Uh, they, he, he, he had coached his team up on what the potential um, uh, uh, the, the signals or uh, uh, vocabulary would be for Sluggo Seam. And uh, John Lynch famously called it out, uh, baited Rich Gannon that he thought, you know, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive down on the, on the, uh, the Sluggo and jump the seam, got the intersection that uh, – Relayed that to Dexter Jackson, who ended up being the Super Bowl MVP. Hey, here comes Sluggo Seam. Here comes Sluggo Seam. He dives down. Obviously, they ran a lot of Tampa, too. Uh, but he dove down, and Gannon thought that he had it on the backside. Jackson did a great job of baiting him. Like Coach Plow showed, a lot of his safeties getting beat in the film. Hey, boom. Comes over, makes a play. Ended up with two picks in that game, by the way. Uh, mm -hmm. And he ended up being Super Bowl MVP. So every time I hear Sluggo Seam, all I can think of is NFL films. You know, John Lynch being mic'd up in his hometown of San Diego in the Super Bowl and, uh, and uh, calling that one out, being a great teammate, letting his other safety know, and safety ended up uh, making a play on the ball and got two picks, MVP wins the game. 
Yeah, I think uh, Danny, do you have any comments on Sluggo or what you think of it? And do you know what Sluggo means? Do you get that? Do you I do. That? I do. I, I understand the the slant and go. I I want to say I know Dylan brought up Norm Chow when he was at USC. Did they? Was that Dwayne Jarrett's route against Notre Dame when it was, it was fourth and eight, and they picked that first Whoa, down? It was. That's, that's that's my only. Uh, I think that was my earliest uh, recognition of what a, a slant and go is. So I'm. <laughs> That's about it, though. It Danny, was, that's Danny, a big time. Danny, that, was nice addition. that was huge. That was huge. Great pull. That's, and then that's the bush a nice push. Addition. That's a great game. Yeah. Horrible <laughs> game. Oh, Brutal game. Sorry, sorry, John. Worst game ever. Sorry, John. Oh, the Catholics lost Johnny, right there. Johnny. Johnny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Johnny. Bush push is illegal. <laughs> well, hey, uh, cool stuff from Coach Plow. Good to have him on. Um, Slogo is a concept that I hope some of you coaches can install during your downtime. Um, and I hope there were some nuggets of wisdom in there. Uh, we'll be back next week with our next episode of Chalk Talk. But uh, for Brock Alvin and the E-Team coaching staff, so long. And we'll talk to you soon. Wait for next week's Mountain Year Minute. Love it. Oh, let's go. <laughs>